We're here to increase our collective understanding of how great cities are shaped. We believe everyone has a role to play in urban design. This is a space where we can learn from international examples and discuss issues relating to built form, the distinctiveness of cities and how we feel connected to place. We can be curious and open-minded. We can all learn and grow. So, let's get to it, Geelong. Hello everyone, welcome to our eighth instalment in the Designing Geelong webinar series. My name is Jonathan Daly. I'm the Manager of Urban Design and Heritage at the City of Greater Geelong and City Design Champion. This is an educational webinar series to help demystify how cities are designed. And it's brought to you by the Revitalising Central Geelong partnership between the City of Greater Geelong and the Victorian Government. We want the whole community to be better able to engage in the process of shaping our city and we hope that the design uh, designing Geelong webinar series will, will help you do that. I'd like to pay my um, respects to um, the Wadawurrung people, the traditional owners of these lands and to the elders and um, past, present and emerging. So the format of this webinar um, is um, as always, um, we'll have um, two um, 15 minute presentations and uh, followed by um, a 30 minute Q&A. So um, feel free to post questions during um, the, the presentations. And um, this is an education webinar series. So we will focus on those questions that really help to improve our understanding of urban design and the particular um, topic today. And please uh, don't forget that the session is being recorded. So today's topic um, is how parking shapes cities. Most of us probably don't give um, much thought to um, parking beyond um, where um, where are they, where can I get one, and, um, and how much um, it's going to cost me. But in reality, few things um, influence or have um, as much of an influence on how a, a city develops, what shape it takes, than parking. So to help us better understand the implications of parking, we've got two fantastic presenters and panelists with us today. Uh, first up, we have Knowles Tivendale. Um, Knowles has um, a, a extensive experience in, in parking, um, has developed a, a wide range of innovative strategies and frameworks um, across Australia. Um, he's, um, these strategies have been published globally and have assisted councils to improve parking accessibility and reduce levels of community frustration and concern. Noel sits on the Parking Management Subcommittee of the US Transportation Research Board and um, has a deep understanding of the importance of parking and the need to improve management processes um, to ensure our significant parking resources are put to the best use. Welcome, Noel. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Tell me if you can't see that. This is a very uh, current photograph, literally taken the other day, um, and parking fees in the city of Melbourne are going down, but it's a very old structure, um, and it's having a certain impact on the footpath. You can tell um, walking past there, and particularly at night, you might not feel as safe as you'd like to. Uh, so it just sprang to mind that that might be a good, a good photograph to start us off with. When we're talking about parking and how it shapes cities, we need a few analogies to help us understand uh, what is it that's going on. There's lots of people who want to use particular space within the city and they want to use that space in a certain way. And I don't necessarily mean um, privatised space, but how do we use the public space and, and whether it's people walking down the street, people enjoying a coffee in the open air, or people finding a way to access the place that they're going to, which might require some parking or even storage of vehicles. Uh, I think of parking as very different to storage because storage tends to be things that we leave there for a long time. And you can think about your kitchen and there are things that you might store on the bench, like the toaster, because you use it all the time. And there are other things you store under the bench because you don't want them parking on the bench and taking up that really valuable space. And so using some analogies to think about who we're serving, we can start to 
unpack whether this car is parked or whether it is stored. It looks to me like it's stored, but it's taking up some space that somebody could otherwise use. You may have noticed that it was a disabled permit zone. Um, so there was a, a sense that, oh, well, nobody else can use that anymore because I'm using it. And a key uh, element of parking and managing parking is about getting better returns for the local economy. So this particular graphic, uh, I'll leave you a bit of time to read the top line. If we've got one car space, one bay, and we can get five people using it in the, a day, and each of those people spends $30 at the local shop, it might be the pharmacy or whatever it is that the car space is near. In one day, we're going to get about $150 of revenue into that shop. So this is not about you know, pricing the space, it's just the revenue that comes into the shop. And if we then multiply that over a large area, let's say 100 bays, and if we can get one extra person, so instead of five turns, we just get six turns six people using those spaces and they're all spending $30 over the whole year, we're generating an extra million dollars of revenue to wherever that space is. You can think about your local shops down the end of the street, or you can think about you know, somewhere in the center of the city. Um, but making sure we get the most number of people into a particular space and maximize the utility of that space is really key to generating the economic benefit and the impact that we want to see in our cities. And the internet is coming. So this is a recent report from Australia Post, which uh, have a, an interest in how many parcels they are delivering. And not surprising, through uh, the COVID year, there's been a significant increase in the online retail spend in Australia. Um, but it's now 16% of all retail sales are online. So we need to be careful about making sure we've got good access to our places, but also being careful about what that access is and how do people actually want to get to the places that we want to see really thrive. So we've looked at a number of centres over decades um, and this is just a, a snapshot of them. How, do pe how many people get here by car to these centres? On the right-hand side, it's the number of visitors arriving by car. And you can see that all those percentages, um, except for two down the bottom, are below 50%. So quite often in our activity centres, we have less than half the shoppers arriving by car. But if we look at the traders, we often have traders who come from further away and they might even have things to do during the day. They might have different reasons for needing their car with them. And so they are much more likely to arrive at the centre by car. Not only that, they then um, there's a tendency uh, for each of us, if we are doing a certain thing a certain way, there's a tendency to expect that other people are doing it the same way we do it. So there's um, some other research that shows that traders tend to overestimate the importance of arrival by car for their visitors. And no matter which centre uh, we are studying, um, we would encourage all the traders to be asking their customers, how did you get here? Where have you come from? You know, why are you here? You know, and that'll help understand and unpack uh, what the really important things for their customers are and the, maybe even unpack the threat that the internet might provide and how we can um, make sure our centers really thrive and survive. Because when we think about a center, we need to understand who's willing to walk. And we need to think about various market segments. And for certain activities, cafe or restaurant, people might not be willing to walk very far at all. I'm only getting a takeaway coffee from the cafe and we've actually got um, survey data that shows almost half the people aren't even willing to walk 10 metres. I've flipped through that very quickly. That was all on auto. Um, and we've got a range of different um, expectations within the market segments about what is a reasonable walking distance 
sorry, I read the, the top line and not the second line. What is a reasonable walking distance to a cafe and restaurant? And so we can see that we get about half the people saying, no, 100 metres, that's about the most I'm willing to walk to the cafe or restaurant from my car. Um, but if, it's, if I'm talking about home, well, I better be parking right close to my house and that's a reasonable walking distance. Whereas if I'm going to work, I've got a, a typically the market segments, there's a greater expectation that I might walk a bit further from the car space to get to where I'm going. And this is um, part of highlighting that experience is really key. So this could be almost any city in the world. Um, the, the reason for the photograph is just to say, is this a nice place to be in? And there are various ways of thinking about what's a nice what place to be in. What's a place that helps us explore, uh, really enriches our life and um, gives us a different experience? I'm gonna go back a little bit. Um, this is one where you cannot get your car into this place, um, but it's actually very car oriented as a location. And what they do is make a really nice place that people can mingle and walk around and um, have the sun shining on them. Uh, lots of nice vistas and a, a large number, 800 cars are in those two car parking uh, buildings just behind you. But these really well-designed, architecturally um, significant uh, parking structures that also are actually automated and nobody can, you don't actually walk up to get to your car. There's an automated lift that goes and gets your car. And so we, we need to understand, we need to remember that it's high quality public realm that really attracts people. Um, they'll find a way to get there. And we've got a couple of little examples. Here we've got a, a quayside in Northern um, Europe. Oh, it's always going too quickly. So I should have done a really good test of that. The, the quayside has got all the car parking located um, against the water. Uh, the cars get a really good view. Um, so that's nice and we've got enough car spaces to serve all the shops. In fact, um, maybe they're not being managed very well because they're, they're always full, but then oh, it's going to really annoy me if it keeps going straight on again. So, but we could think of it a different way and have the um, quayside used for people who then enjoy a nice view of the water. Um, and I don't know how all those people got there, but I can see there's a van, so there's an ability to still get a car there. Oh my goodness! Sorry, little gremlin in my in my system there. I've um, anyway, apologies for that. And then here's an example in um, up the road uh, in Melbourne, where there used to be factories and a road right on the river. You could park your car right alongside the river. You might recognise the Hamer Hall in the background. So this is on the southern side of the Yarra River, and over time, uh, factory closed, redevelopment occurs, and there was a decision not to have that road right in front of the river, and rather to reallocate that bit of the space to people, outdoor dining, Yarra Promenade instead of um, Yarra Boulevard in the road. And we need to think about this holistic management of public space so that our, our place and economic and parking strategies on the left-hand side come together and get interwoven and then through um, hopefully a series of evolution processes they become this foundational space related strategies. That helps us to set the context um, in, in this analogy for how we want to use our hard drive. Um, my hard drive, uh, there's a lot of photos which uh, you know, if I use my hard drive you'd see all the photos, this orange thing uh, in the middle of them. Everyone uses their hard drive differently. Every city uses their public space differently. And so we need to um, think about how do we want the public space to be used and how much of it do we want to be used, do we want used for certain things? That'll help us understand the overall supply. And then we can um, make some judgment about what sort of controls can be applied to help serve all the different market segments that we need to serve because we remember that some people are willing to walk further, other people aren't willing to walk very far, 
it almost depends on their trip, not who they are. It depends on what sort of trip they're making that particular day. And then we can monitor those um, controls and see how that's affecting demand and um, provide alternatives to make sure that if people do have other options and choices and they might like to not drive today, but they still want to make the trip, then they've got some alternatives they can use to get that trip um, done. And so by giving people choices, you can see here we've got a, a map of a fairly famous arena um, and there's lots of choices for where people might park themselves. Um, in this case, we actually say, you can park yourself right in the middle of the arena because we're just having a concert. It's not a football game. And this introduces the concept that at this arena, people pay in all sorts of different ways. So some of them, they know that they get their best seat, they get their best parking spot by getting up early. They might walk further, they might have an anxious search, or in some cases, they just pay to be in a particular location. There are even some people in the arena who don't pay, but it's a bit of a um, lost leader, so to speak. And you get your free ticket into the corporate box, but you know there's some schmoozing going on. And then we can manage demand by location. So the, the whoops, it's going a bit fast again. So managing demand by location, we can make sure that we've got availability of spaces in every particular part of the arena, so to speak, um, and making sure that people can get to park where they want to park to maximize the utility of those spaces. And I think about Chadston and think about all the complaints that must come into Chadston because I can't park out the front of the Uniqlo shop and I can't park outside the front of the other shop on the right hand side. I can't park in the food court. Um, I can't park in any of these places. And what Chadston does is push all the parking to the outside and says, you will not be able to park in the core because that's for people. That's for maximizing the economic return. That's our high quality public realm in a Chadston sense. They don't, um, I think they try and make it feel like you're outdoors, but they've also got it air conditioned. Oh, I wanted to make one more point on that now. So pushing the parking out to the outside, just draw your attention to the hotel. And so another thing Chadston is doing is realizing they need to put more people right near their center. Otherwise it, it's going to weaken their center over time because the internet is coming. So we need more offices, we need more hotel, we need more accommodation, we need more residents. And this is an interesting case, I think, because Chadston doesn't really have the public realm that a place like Geelong has. Uh, this is the view from the hotel. So fantastic view, um, recommend you check it out. Uh, best car park in, in Melbourne. Um, and you can see a, I know, a lot of other things about the internal workings of how Chadston operates. Um, it's a very unique hotel experience. Bring it down to something a bit more local. Um, think about Warren Ponds. One of the things that uh, a place like Chadston or cities that are developing do well is they put things close together. These little arrows that are appearing, the shortest one is 100 metres. The second one is 500 metres. The long one is a kilometre. We're not squishing things together enough. We're not putting things in close proximity to each other, which is part of why when my um, daughter uh, says, let's go to Bunnings on a Sunday, she's thinking about the picnic and she's thinking about the barbecue sausage, but I'm not thinking Bunnings is a great place to have the picnic. And what we need is to try and think about how we provide parking in a way that still makes for a really nice place to have a picnic and spend some money in the cafe, um, et cetera. Garama Place in Canberra have thought about this quite carefully, pedestrianised for parking around the edge. And this is taking us back to one of those earlier images with really recognising where the highest value locations are in our city and putting the parking around the edge in the lower value locations that we don't need everybody to be hanging out in. We put the, the parking in the places where we uh, know that we're not going to impede everybody else having a really good time. 
Hopefully you've had a bit of snow. So I'll show that very quickly. Thank you, Noel. Starters, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, that was really interesting. And um, before we move on, to, well, while Steve is getting um, set up, um, could you tell us maybe what, what sort of one, one or two of the um, latest, greatest in, um, innovations in parking that um, that cities are, um, some cities are implementing around the world? So the the technological innovation is is all to do with um, smartphones and being able to track things so sensors in bays knowing whether the bay is empty or full um, in some cases pushing that data out into the into the public realm um, even to third party providers so that you you can give the broad community an idea of whether there is a space available or not um, and and that then allows for other things you know the, the phone app where you book for space or you pay for the space. Um, and people are doing that in both private settings and in public space settings. Um, and then in a, in a, let's say, not a technological sense, I think there's a, a much greater, there is a few leaps and bounds in the understanding of how we manage space and how important that is to creating really vibrant cities that we enjoy being in. So places we enjoy being in. The reason for sort of showing the Bunnings car park, it's not a place that we want to hang out in. And what we want is cities where we've got the access, we've got the best of both worlds. We've got the access, but it's a place that I really want to hang out in. And, and that'll encourage me to walk and explore the space and then spend more money. So there's a, I think there's a philosophical, much better understanding over the last 10 years around the world, globally. This is not a, this is not a unique topic to, to just Geelong. Um, and that greater understanding, even in a European city context, they've got places where you can park right in the town square, and there are other cities who are saying, actually, I prefer a town square just to be full of cafes rather than full of cars. Yeah. Um, we, I think we'll come back to this, and I'm sure we will in the, in the Q&A. Right. Um, thank you, Knowles. Um, we'll move on to the second presentation. So next up, we've got um, Steve Thorne. Steve is a, a qualified architect and urban designer and the director of Design Urban. Um, he's worked in both the private and public sectors and held various positions um, over the years. Um, he's formerly the director of urban design for the Victorian State Government and principal urban designer at the City of Melbourne. Uh, he's been a speaker at many professional and industry conferences on sustainable urbanism, design, um, urban structure, community safety, um, and transit-oriented development. Um, Steve's also been awarded more than 35 international um, and national and state urban design awards for his um, work. Um, and Steve's also sat on a number of design review panels, both in Australia and overseas. So very, very experienced um, individual, and um, we're delighted to, to have him here today. So over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um... I'm on Wurundjeri country today, so I pay my respects to um, uh, leaders past, present and emerging, um, and say good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'll share my screen um, and really to talk about how parking shapes cities. Um, the, 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 the first question is why we gather in cities in the first place. We gather together to um, transact with each other, both socially as well as economically, psychologically. We, we, we exchange um, a, a whole range of things while minimizing the amount of travel that we need to do in order to do that. Um, and so things have changed dramatically in the past hundred years. Um, traditionally, um, we had, uh, we had cities that were developed before the motor car um, and they had a particular character. Um, that character um, was very much around maximizing that ability to exchange with each other. Um, similarly, um, that those cities today can still accommodate cars, um, but with some difficulty. Um, and most of the places are places like this which 
are places for pedestrians rather than for motor vehicles. And so if we then turn to um, the, the, um, the car city of all car cities, which is Detroit, and we start to look at its urban form, you can see that parking has become a significant component of the way that that city is, is planned and thought about. And it looks a little bit like this, um, where parking is a significant component of, of that city. In fact, if you start to measure that, you can see how much of the space shown here in red is taken up by surface car parking. Um, with very little urban form resulting from it. Um, and so there is a significant impact that the car has had on cities and in the way that we think about cities. But that doesn't mean that we have to, con we, we all have to become like Detroit. Um, and so we can start to measure and appreciate what we've got in terms of the kind of places that we're making um, and start to find the significant places where cars are being stored um, and start to look at how we can change that. Now, in the work that, that I do, I get the same kind of comments coming almost in every public workshop that one does. Um, the first one is from traders is that people must be able to park in front of my shop. That is heard often. Everyone says there's not enough parking. There's never enough parking. And a lot of folks will say, well, angled parking means that there's more parking. Well, let's unpick that. Um, and parking doesn't affect building design. Well, building design doesn't have an effect on, on the social and economic performance in a city. Um, and that, it, that it, it is plainly not true. And so what I want to do is to unpick all of these, these comments that, that one hears so often. The first one is that people must be able to park in front of my shop. And if I can maximize the number of parks in front of the shop, it'll all be better um, in an economic sense. And Knowles has touched on this to some extent earlier on. So if I draw a little cartoon and say, well, actually the location of the parking is actually a strategic um, event and a strategic decision. And that one needs to locate it to maximize the social and economic exchange that takes place. So if I'm going to this shop and I end up parking my car in front of it, I move into that shop, I spend the dollars and I move back out, get out into my car and I drive away. If the parking is in a different kind of a location in the cartoon to the bottom, um, I still wanna to go to the same shop, but I might park slightly remote from it, walk to the shop, spend my dollar, and on the way back, I might actually see something that, that is of interest to me in the other shops, and I might spend in those shops as well. And so if, if everyone is parking directly outside the shop they want to go to, it means that those other expenditures might not happen. And you might not be exposed to things um, that, are more that, that might interest you uh, in, in other shops. So, you know, a quick cartoon about this idea of increasing economic exchange and also social exchange, because obviously if we're walking, um, we bump into people and we have those social exchanges. So where you place the parking has an effect. And so again, three little cartoons. One is uh, which most, most um, shopping centers would like to provide is to set the parking in front of the shops so that people know exactly where they're going and where they can park. That's great if you're in a car, but not so much if you're walking past this, um, this, this particular set of shops. The other way is to say, okay, well, let's turn the, side, the parking sideways and let's turn the shop sideways so that we have some interaction with the street, um, but we also know where people are gonna park. Um, and that starts to support some areas for walking because um, the shops are directly adjacent to the footpath. Um, uh, and, and we still have a parking condition. The last one is one where the parking is at the back of the shop, but also in the street. And so that um, things like alfresco dining become possible. This is a much more of a social condition and a, and a condition where economic and social exchange is much more possible than in the other two examples. Um, the ideal is obviously um, parking in the basement, 
um, but that it involves a, a good deal more expenditure. And so if we talk about pedestrians and the factors that support walking comfort um, in, in, in towns and cities, having cars parked in the streets provides a barrier of steel for pedestrians and it, it, it contributes to the walking comfort and the pleasure of being in towns. Um, it's one of many components, as this little sketch shows, um, of, of various aspects of the way in which places are planned and designed that actually make people feel comfortable walking in, in town centres. And, and equally, ground floor activation is very important if we are to achieve engaging, thriving and living centres um, in, in our towns. So we need to maintain visual interest for people who are walking and, and parking is part of that. The other thing that we need to look to is the way in which architecture and design um, is fine grained, is human scaled, has high quality materials, is tactile, is not over glazed. And so what I'm showing in the top two images is buildings that are just glazing, which are, if you're walking past this, the experience for as long as it takes to walk past, does not change, it's exactly the same as you walk past, so it's boring. We need interest, visual interest, when we need interest at walking pace, not blank walls. And that extends to the buildings themselves, that vertical proportions in, in town centers and in city centers are much more important than the kind of horizontal proportions that you experience from a car. So trying to avoid these long, um, uh, horizontal experiences and actually making places that are far more vertical in their proportioning systems. To come back to parking and to come back to a local government experience that I had, I worked in local government in Western Australia for a while. And so this is a picture of the town centre in Gosnells. Um, Gosnells sits on the Albany Highway, which runs through the middle of the town centre. It has a railway station which is um, behind a bowling club and is back fenced on both sides. Um, and sadly, there was a shooting um, uh, incident on, that, on the station platform, um, which started to get a conversation about community safety happening. When I first joined Gosnells, it, was, it, it had a 40% vacancy in the shops and it was described as an above ground cemetery, a little unkind, but probably true. And despite the fact that it was 40% vacant, people said, well, there's not enough parking. So what we did is we counted the number of parking bays and we then reversed the parking scheme. Now, the, the planning scheme, most planning schemes have rates at which parking is to be provided. And, and so we were able to calculate backwards from the number of parking bays that we had um, to how much retail, for example, could be supported by that parking. The number of bays that Gosnells had would have, would have supported 52,000 square meters of retail. And when measured, we found that we only had 18,000 square meters of retail. So there was a complete misfit between what people perceived to be the problem and the actual problem. And so we started to do things like um, try to create a new little main street and then said, well, if we move the railway station, can we connect that main street in such a way that the, the bulk of where the people live um, was actually connected in a meaningful way? And that meant um, at that time in 1999, um, introducing a new level crossing, we had to give up six in order to get that one um, created. And so a new vision was, was developed for the town, um, one which involved moving the railway station 300 meters and also creating that new main street. The railway station has been moved, the level crossing has been provided, and uh, if the pedestrian crossing across that level crossing is actually part of the railway station itself. So that's happened, the main street has been developed and is continuing to develop. Um, so in 2021, Gosnells has no vacancies. The other thing that happened in 1999, we said, Given that we can support 52,000 square meters of retail and we only have 18, why don't we stop the requirement for parking? Um, and when we've got a parking problem, let's actually uh, re-energize re the parking need. 
So we were able to say to people, you can develop here with no parking um, until such time as we are getting um, uh, a, an economic uplift. And so you start to see in around the main street, new buildings emerging. This is a new building, this is another one. These sites are being cleared for new buildings which are coming in the next 18 months. And to date, there's been a $365 million inward investment into this uh, town center. New buildings and no new parking. Now to come to some of those other um, uh, myths, uh, angle parking means more parking. Well, that's fine, but angle parking can be quite aggressive for the pedestrian environment. Um, and so what you very seldom see with angled parking is, is al fresco dining directly onto the curb line. And it also makes it very difficult for people to walk, particularly those in wheelchairs and, and sight impaired, walking along these edges where you've got tow bars and the like sticking out into, car, in, in, into the walking environment. So one example where we said, okay, um, this was a, a, a small town in, in Wellington, in New Zealand. Um, this is the existing condition. Um, they had 94 parking bays and three trees in, in this little center. These are all shops on, on the upper side of the street. Um, it, there was a big swimming pool on this side, which was um, to, due to be demolished. And so we wanted to create a new a, a street connecting to this um, retail street. We redesigned it in such a way that that aggression of the parking coming in at, at, at an angle onto the footpath was changed so that we got parallel parking all the way along those footpaths. We were able to extend the footpath slightly so that al fresco dining was possible. And we created parking in the middle of the street um, and were able to increase it by 10 parking bays overall, plus an additional 30 trees um, into this area. So that cooling of the, of the street was also a possibility in order to increase the amenity for people walking, but also to affect climate change in a positive sense. Uh, another example in New Zealand again, was another street, which uh, in this case in a very small town, which had very few opportunities for al fresco dining, even though these were mainly restaurants. Um, and so again, it was redesigned, the footpaths were widened, al fresco dining is now a possibility. There's more parking than there was before, there are more street trees, and there's more surface cooling, uh, which is again um, part of an effort to deal with climate change. Um, another street um, taken more locally has 23 parking bays existing. They're all angled. That could be changed uh, and the median could be planted in such a way that you start to cool the street and still have 23 parking bays. Similarly, um, this street has currently got 50, three parking bays in that block um, and it has 15 street trees. We can increase the parking to 72 and we can increase the number of trees to 42 by simply reconfiguring the way in which the parking is made and start to affect the performance of the city both in an environmental sense but also in a social sense. Um, and so parking really, what, all I'm really saying is that parking should not be viewed in isolation. It should be viewed as part of a complexity in the way that we strategically think about cities. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Steve. Um, I think the, the, the complications and implications um, of, of parking, um, you know, even from these two um, short discussions, presentations are, um, are very evident and some of the comments I think we're getting through sort of um, illustrate that as well. Um, there are undoubtedly so many variables to consider um, for, for so many different people, different contexts and, and so on. Um, and I think we're, 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 we're um, very uh, much aware of, of that. But um, just coming back to um, one of the um, issues that um, that Knowles raised, and um, just before I do, um, 
before we get into this, um, please, um, if you've got some questions, um, drop it into the um, the Q and A um, or the chat, and um, um, I will put them to the to our panelists. Um, but just to get the conversation going, Noel, you touched on um, the the context of you know these sort of large scale um, out of town or outer um, shopping centres, and um, this is something that comes up quite regularly. Um, how do city centres compete with these um, sort of environments? Um, and I think when you start to unpack this, it, a really sort of interesting um, conversation um, develops because we think about um, these outer shopping centres as being really convenient places mm -hmm. in terms of parking. Um, but maybe we don't think um, about some of the inconveniences that um, exist there compared to city centres. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a really interesting human psychology going on, and we, we shouldn't pretend that we're dealing with a little a little organisation when we're thinking about a big shopping centre. They're often multinational. Yeah, they're very big organisations. They know what they're doing from a human behaviour and human psychology perspective. They're trying to create the best possible experience for people to open their wallets, and they do a lot of research, understanding who's there, where they've come from, how they got here, all those things, uh, and how much they spent while they're here. And the, the lessons we can draw from that is it's all about the experience. It's all about that experience when I'm in the moment near a shop, should I buy that or not? Am I feeling good or am I feeling a bit ordinary because I just had a really bad parking experience or something? And I think there's a there's a concept that we get you to park outside. The parking might have been a bad experience. Um, and for those who want to avoid that, we'll try and put in some other things. We'll put in some lights in the in the car park and what have you. We might even have a valet, um, you know, if you're really high, you know, if we really want to make sure you're happy. But once you step over the threshold and you're in the centre, there's an expectation of, you know, I'm safe. I'm really comfortable. In fact, I'm excited. And, and working on those human behavioral and psychological tools in all of our cities and in all of our centers, whether it's even the local shops at Heighton or something, you know, work on all of those um, psychological factors to say, this is a really nice place to be. And I want to hang out there more. Yeah. And so when my daughter says, hey, let's go down to the It'll be bubble tea at the moment. You know, let's go down to the bubble tea shop. Um, I'm thinking, oh yeah, that sounds that sounds like a fun time underneath the trees and pleasant experience. And while we're there, oh, I might stop in uh, the pharmacy or the bookshop or whatever else that's that's in the same location. Mm. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but it's. I, I think there's so many different aspects to it that that mm. that makes it really interesting. Um, I think that that point that you raised and, and Steve raised it as well um, about you know if if you build a city around the car then um, everything becomes a destination mm. right you, mm. you go to what typically you go to one place and then you you, you leave um, whereas um, if you build a city around um, around people and around an experience then you do get that situation where people yeah, you've got a destination, somewhere you want to go and things you need to do. Um, but in sort of walking and moving around, you'll do other things yes. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you as an individual can um, can take off a number of sort of um, chores or maybe things that you have to do, but um, it's better for, for the local economy because people mm -hmm. will, will generally spend more money. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, you know, I'm just thinking about so, someone, uh, Catherine in, in the chat had mentioned about, you know, walking from Geelong Station to, to Westfield. Um, and yeah, you might, um, I, I looked that up, it's, a, it's about a nine minute walk. You, you might think, oh, that's, that's too, maybe too long for me, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe you think, you could, alternatively, you might think about it, well, if it's the, um, the weekend or if it's um, lunchtime, um, I've got something to buy in, in Westfield, but you know, I'm going to walk through Little Mallop Street 
and there's lots of nice cafes and restaurants and you know I might stop there and have lunch I might meet up with a friend I might go to Johnson Park and um, and hang out there you know you start to think about doing sort of multiple things um, well, it's a trip I've done many times and um, not surprising to people on the um, in the session you can do it in many different ways mm. you, you can you can walk down different streets and see what's going on in that street at the moment oh i knew they were doing some work in little mallop or i knew there was a new store going in i wonder what it is um and you you sort of have that exploration going on um and there's some other things that we know from the retail economy retail sector about how to drag people you know we know the places that are going to attract more people the, the type of shops or whatever it is it's the reason why the milk is down the back of the supermarket or the pharmacy, if they know what they're doing, they have the, the script counter at the back of the pharmacy because they're dragging you past all the other things to do, exploration to do. Oh, I didn't realize they had perfume, you know, whatever it is. And so we can treat our, we should think of our cities in that type of way. We, we really, you know, Steve made a great point about we really don't want people parking right next to where they're going and just ducking in, ducking out and going and leaving. Um, we found the average car parking occurrence in a place like Bridge Road is only 18 minutes, mm. which is alarming. You know, that, that you, hang on, that's, you're only spending that long here. That means you're not exploring at all. You don't even know what's on the next block. Yeah. Um, Steve, I, I'm going to come to you with a really big one. Um, we we know um, that you know we, we, we need access by car, um, and and there are certain users of the city that um, it's absolutely essential. Um, there's no doubt about that. But we also know that um, it's a very space intensive use. Um, how do we balance those demands, given that? You know, we, we need our public space to do so many other things for us, not least in terms of the the, the economy um, of the of city centres, but the, the the livability, and also now particularly in terms of um, responding to to climate change. So, how how, how can we, in a broad sense, really um, address that that challenge? It, it it is a balancing act, and it's and it's around increasing people's choices. Um, in, in how they access the city. Um, and so successful cities are those that have, um, have go from the, the, the chore of having to do something to the joy of doing something. And so making places that are joyful to be in. Um, and so that, that, that is a shift from having to get stuff to doing stuff. Um, so, you know, it's exactly what Niles is saying. Um, the, the, the big box shopping centers are very good at that, um, that, you know, doing stuff thing. And so entertainment has become much more of a component of how they work. And we should think about city centers like that as well, that entertaining people, not, not just through performances, but through the visual excitement of actually being there. Um, is, is a significant component of making the city successful. And so avoiding things like, you know, multiple blank walls um, of, of having activation of, of buildings. Um, these are the, the absolute minimum things that we should be doing. I, d I, did, I did note the, the, the comment about walking from um, the Geelong station to Westfields. I think if you are doing the kind of bulk shopping that you need to do, we all need to do. Um, it would be unreasonable to ask people to be doing that um, in any other way other than to be able to fill a boot of a car. Um, and, and so where we place parking is a strategic decision. And so outside, for example, supermarkets, having a significant car park is, is, is a good thing. But in that example that I showed, if that parking is placed in front of the supermarket, it diminishes the quality of the street, <coughs> excuse me, and therefore the, the quality of the experience of someone in that street. 
And, and therein lies um, the, the dilemma of how do we balance the options for people who want to walk, who want to cycle, who want to use a scooter, who want to use a car, who want to use public transport. It's a real balancing act. Mm. Oh, can I jump in, Jonathan, just say that the sure that proximity of uses is really important. So the, the graphic showing the car park with the, you know, in, at the front of the street, we've done some research around um, shopping centers that are on either side of the road with their car park in front where there is a desire to go from this center to that center because there's you know things in both and only of all the people going between the center and the other side of the road and the other center only four percent walked because they've got to walk through a car park and i'm walking past my car oh, oh i've got my keys i'll just get in my car and they're only driving 100 meters, literally driving across a signalized intersection into the other car park. Um, it's amazing, really, that it, it creates such a barrier. A car park becomes a barrier to expanding that economic footprint of a place. It doesn't matter what the place is. It can be a small place or a big place, but that, that sort of open bitumen space that's really hostile is a big barrier to expanding the economic footprint mm. yeah um there's a, a few um i'm going to try and sort of um bring a few comments and questions to, to together um so i'm conscious of the time we always we never have enough time to to have these discussions um but i, I think there's a few comments around I, I guess the issue that um you need a you know you need a concentration of people living in um, city centres um, to, to reduce demand um, for parking. I think that, that I'm not saying this is a fact. I'm saying that, that this is just uh, I think was coming through in a few of the comments. Um, and Central Geelong um, at the moment currently has a very low um, residential population, um, around I think around 2,000 people, um, but with projections to grow to to 12,000. And, um, and we're also kicking off a project very soon called Living 3220, um, which is a residential strategy for the city, but getting more people to live in the city. Um, would either of you like to, to, to talk to that? I mean, is a residential population in uh, the center of the city absolutely essential to having, um, I guess, a, a less car dependent um, center um, or, or not? I think the one leads to the other. Um, if you don't have people living there, they're driving out and going somewhere else. Um, and so having people in town not only increases the potential viability of shops, it increases the level of surveillance, of safety, of septed. Um, these are all positive things, uh, having people living in town. So I've, I've lived in the middle of a number of regional towns, Horsham, Ballarat, and I'm in right in the centre, above a shop on the third floor of the TNG building. Yeah, you sort of get the idea. Um, the, uh, I think Deakin University students live in the TNG building in Geelong. I think that's right. Um, and it's it's really interesting how my psychology changed over the years I was living in those particular locations because I ended up getting really lazy. It was, it was quite astounding. I'd, I'd walk up the stairs realized I didn't have anything in the fridge for dinner. And I'd be so annoyed that I had to go out down the stairs, across the road, literally across the road and walk through the car park to get to Coles. Now it might've been that I had to walk through the car park, but Coles was literally across the road and the psychology changes depending on your expectations. So putting, putting residents in any retail area, and maximizing the number of residents within walking distance of that retail area is going to protect it in a way. It's going to certainly insulate it against the um, changes we're going to see from the internet. You know, I mentioned a bookstore before and you might've all said, what, I've never even seen a bookstore in the last five years. I know my local bookstores are a very long way away. Um, and that is likely to, yeah, that's likely to be a trend that it is 
not going to go away. We're going to be getting a lot more deliveries over the coming decades. And so insulating our centres so that they have a reservoir of local residents for whom, oh, why would I even bother getting on the internet? I can just go out and get it. It's just down there. Just go and, mm. go and grab it. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to move on to another one. I'm, again, um, I'm going to try and put um, a couple of questions together. So one from Andrew and one from, um, I think it's Abigail. I hope I've got that right um, pronunciation. Um, Andrew's talking about this situation where we quite often get, um, um, I, I think particularly in, in um, it, with new development, we get the large shopping center and then we get the sort of big box configuration that, that follows that, the sort of a pattern of, um, of development that comes with it. And, um, and Abigail's asking a couple of questions around um, uh, the growth areas. And um, we've got lots of examples, lots of examples about um, probably how not to do that um, around Australia. Um, but how can we break from these cycles of where, um, you know, we seem to be, um, when it comes to the, um, the residential that we're, we're creating very car dependent new growth areas. And when it comes to the, the retail um, component that comes with them, um, that it's, it, it is this sort of typical big box configuration. Uh, it, 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 Andrew asks a very good question and, and it relates to, um, I guess, street-based walkable town centres. Um, the reality is that in Australia and New Zealand, we haven't built one of those since the First World War. We built hybrids, you know, places like Point Cook, Rouse Hill, uh, have been built, but we haven't built a true walkable um, street-based town centre since the First World War. It, it's staggering. And that is because of the dominance um, of, of the model of development of the internalised um, shopping mall and of a supermarket-based um, retail approach. Um, how we shift that um, over time, I think COVID is has given us some new indications of the importance of your local place. Um, and so making walkable, street-oriented, good places locally um, starts to shift the game a little bit in, in the direction of trying to get um, some of these street-based centres actually starting to work. So I think that there is hope there, but we've got a long way to go. And the industry um, uh, probably is in need of a shift. And as, as Knowles has said, the internet is coming. Um, the, the model um, won't work long-term. And so making places where people have an experience and where they can experience the joy of being with others um, is, is part of the challenge um, in front of us. This is, um, it, it's a topic in itself. I mean, we could probably have a, a, a webinar just on, on this, uh, this very issue. Um, I'm, I'm really conscious of time and we're, 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 we're probably, uh, we're up, it, it's just gone uh, 1 p.m. Um, we probably even, we haven't even got into kind of talking about how car parking um, shapes the city uh, vertically. Um, whether we put parking above ground or below ground has an impact on, on the heights of our uh, buildings. Um, we, we, we were certainly talking about the issue of, of urban space and uh, the um, demands of parking places on urban space. And, and all of this also leads to how cities grow horizontally as well, um, which is a significant problem. And, and we didn't even mention um, alternatives to, to um to, to, to the need for parking, uh, particularly uh, public transport and um, walking and cycling and so on. We, we, we've got big challenges in, in, in that particular area in, in Geelong. Um, people need viable alternatives um, to the car um, to be able to, to, um, to make that choice. And um, yeah, so it's such a broad um, subject that really touches almost every aspect of, of urban development. Um, Steve, Knowles, thank you very much for um, helping us start that conversation. I think it's one that's going to continue um, for a long time, one that's um, um, very, very um, emotional topic. 
uh, very divisive topic, very political. Steve's right, you can't get away from the politics. Um, but thank you very much um, today for your presentations, for the discussion. Um, like, like I said, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be continuing this for quite a while to come. Um, thanks everyone for joining in today. I'm really sorry that um, for anyone that um, any of your questions that we didn't get to. Um, this is um, such a, a very complex um, subject. But um, um, I hope we will be able to continue the conversation um, in different forums. I hope we'll see you all again at our next webinar. The next topic is why great streets make great cities. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us for that. So take care, everyone. And um, we look forward to seeing you um, all again next month. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan. I'll be there.